So just before I pass it over to you, Norbert, I'll, uh, I'll just give a bit of introduction of who Interfacing is for any of you that are attending today that haven't worked with our company in the past. Uh, Interfacing has been around uh, since the mid 80s actually, in uh, focused really on, uh, oh, here we are, the slide, sorry, there's a bit of a delay there. So we've been in the, for over 25 years in, in software development for process-based solutions. And over those years, it went from modeling to simulation, really business process re-engineering, through to the stage of business process management, uh, and all the way into today's years, which is really, uh, it's a full-scale transformation platform. So we have uh, modules that range for quality management, governance, risk, and compliance, process improvement, that's where really We'll touch on Norbert's part with the uh, being able to do lean analysis. But uh, really, we're at the point of collaboration platform for continuous improvement, collaboration, governance, as well as we have um, modules for automation, integration, monitoring, and operational intelligence, which is really the concept of uh, being able to have access to intelligence data at the point uh, and our even artificial intelligence in terms of the data that you need at that point of decision. Uh, so that's really interesting. That's where we are today. So what I mean is we've been in this field for a very long time. We have customers worldwide. We have offices internationally with 24 seven support. We have uh, partners globally. And even though we've been in the industry for a long time, we continue to win awards. These are all of these awards are as of last year and this year. We continue to uh, actually, we just got the uh, Game Changers Award and we're just notified we're also in the latest Gartner Digital Twin Report as well. So we'd be happy to uh, support you and our platform, uh, as I mentioned, has multiple modules. Obviously you can start with just basic uh, mapping in the cloud and sharing and collaborating, but really the focus is two major components of the solution, the transformation platform and the digital business platform. The transformation platform has everything to do with standardization, continuous improvement, governance, and also used as a tool for systems requirements against of rolling out new solutions, integration of your different uh, applications that you have in-house, whether that be SAP, Oracle, Salesforce, and whatnot. And then our digital business platform, which is a full-on automation, rapid application development toolkit from forms design, master data design, uh, meaning really designing the database level, the entities, business rules, process automation, uh, monitoring, event management, dashboarding, reporting. So really a full-scale transformation suite. And of course, feel free to reach out. We'd be happy to set up a demonstration and provide you with access to this tool in the cloud. That's it for my part, just to give you a brief introduction who we are, We're really a software and services provider focused solely on uh, this industry. Now I'll pass it over to Norbert to introduce himself and uh, uh, hand over the mic to you. So thanks again, Norbert, for taking the time today. Well, you're welcome. Thank you for and um, uh, your organization for giving me the opportunity to share some of uh, my thoughts here um, through this uh, platform. Uh, I spent my whole career in uh, innovation, product development, and um, for the last um, probably 12, 13 years of my career, uh, implemented uh, lean in uh, lean thinking in the innovation creation process. I just retired from uh, from Goodyear um, a few months ago, and uh, right now I try to stay busy um, in the same thinking, in the same area, doing stuff like um, doing right now. Um, why would you want to innovate? And uh, I'm going to use this picture. Um, this is actually the first digital camera that was ever made. It uh, worked well. I know the people who uh, developed it. And um, uh, you could uh, display the, the pictures on a, uh, on a standard TV. 
And it's interesting who made this camera because uh, it, this was actually Kodak that made that camera. Well, uh, you all know where Kodak is today. Kodak is bankrupt. Uh, Kodak never played any role in any digital photography out there. They tried it a few times, uh, but uh, way too late. Actually, the Kodak camera was 10 years before any competitor had a product out. Uh, this is 1985, um, uh, the first Sony camera. So you really uh, need to ask yourself why uh, Kodak had the technology and probably um, several other companies had the technology. Why are they not the leaders in digital photography today? Well, the reason is probably because Kodak uh, at the time, uh, 1975, had, what is it, 80 or 90 percent of the film market and uh, made tons of money on film. And they just did not want film to go away. So why do great companies like Kodak uh, fail at innovation? And uh, the, the, the answer is companies do not fa uh, fail because they don't have the technology or they do not know how to build the product. They fail because they fail to build what customers want. Uh, customers don't want film anymore. and. Um, uh, that's the part that um, that uh, tripped uh, that tripped Kodak up. And the innovation, if you look at innovation today, it's not what it used to be. Um, if, if, uh, pretty much service innovation today is the the big one, and uh, you see a bunch of uh, names here. Uh, you probably recognize them uh, very easily. I also threw a hospital in there because. Uh, that's what uh, keeps uh, that hospital competitive. They're, um, they're thriving um, or their focus on innovation. In 10 years, about 50% of the Fortune 500 companies will not be on that list anymore. If you look what's going on today, uh, I have three time spans here and you see what happened there between uh, 2006 and 2017. That's a little bit more than 10 years. Uh, manufacturing and marketing companies uh, pretty much have disappeared. Uh, today it's all Google, Microsoft, uh, Apple, Amazon and Facebook. And uh, I would not even uh, dare to make a guess where this is going to be in the next five or ten years. So why do we have to uh, do lean and uh, why do we have to do it at Goodyear? And I have a few uh, ideas there. First of all, uh, safety quality were good and um, uh, the directive from leadership was they must continue that trend. Uh, but we were late on everything that we launched, or virtually everything. Only uh, projects where we had a contract on less than 20% uh, were delivered on time. We were extremely slow. Only 50% of the new products uh, were profitable. And this is something that uh, really puzzled me at that time. Uh, very low engagement scores and uh, we had people quit because they didn't have enough work to do. And uh, this is actually uh, what raised, uh, what really got the leadership's and management's attention. Why are people quitting the company because they don't have enough to do and we don't get anything done. We don't get anything out uh, the door. And uh, we actually did hire a consultant and um, the consultant after um, uh, looking at uh, the work we were doing said, hey, uh, we can't really help you. And uh, we said, why not? And he said, well, you hired us to improve your process, but you don't have one. So how can we help you? Well, that kind of sunk in and uh, we um, uh, embarked on a major lean uh, initiative seven years later. Uh, safety was still at all time high. Uh, we launch every year, we were able to launch 1,500 new products. 95% uh, of them were on time. The other few percent, uh, we did not miss the launch. They just missed our internal target. And 100% of the projects are profitable today. 75% uh, is the, the amount that uh, the speed got reduced by. So and. Um, an engineer today at Goodyear does about three times more uh, product development work than they did before this initiative, without working any harder, by the way. And uh, the engagement scores um, went up significantly. And actually, uh, the Goodyear Innovation Center received the AME Operational Excellence Award in uh, 2016. Now, I want to 
uh, uh, really uh, stress here, the AME uh, award is a manufacturing protocol. And now you're taking a manufacturing protocol and uh, you um, uh, apply it to product development innovation and it works really fine. Uh, this is something that uh, a lot of people think uh, lean doesn't work in innovation or product development, especially the manufacturing kind of thinking, but uh, we have proven uh, just the opposite. So what is uh, innovation or re uh, product development about today? Um, product life cycles have come down uh, very drastically, not only on cell phones and computers and so on, but uh, pretty much across the industry. Complexity has gone up at uh, a very, very uh, high rate. Um, there is not only uh, uh, even uh, vehicle models. The other day, a German uh, car company has um, 18 different models uh, just in one, uh, uh, just one model has 18 different versions. I mean, that is, an enormous uh, complexity and by the way every one of those 18 has a different tire and uh, here's the problem the spending has not keep, kept pace with it in fact most companies have uh, are very uh, leveled at their spending they just can't afford to spend uh, money in the same rate that they have to uh, serve the market so we really have to learn to do more with less and uh, a good example that I like to, to quote here is a, um, uh, a few years ago, I visited Porsche, the, the, the car company, the, uh, the development center, innovation center, and they told us that for the last 20 years, they have a flat budget, uh, flat staffing, and no increase in space. So they have been able for 20 years now to keep spending space and um, uh, 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 and the headcount the same. However, during that time they have launched, um, well, uh, before they started Lean, they only had one platform. Today they have at least seven or eight very successful platforms doing a lot, a lot, a lot more work with no increase in budget, no increase in headcount, no increase in, um, in space. So it obviously uh, can be done. So I want to share how we did it at Goodyear, of course. So we were faced with the same situation, no money, uh, no additional R&D money, but do three times um, as much work and have everything uh, come out uh, on time when the customer needs it. So I'm going to talk about uh, some prerequisites, then I talk about the process, then I talk about the people. So prerequisites, uh, to, uh, I want to talk about organization. By the way, I want to stress these because most people jump into a lean initiative without understanding this and then they wonder why uh, they are so challenged or why things um, have become so difficult. So the first one I'd like to talk about is organization and um, uh, you probably know this, you got your silos here, uh, functions, that's how most uh, companies are organized in R&D. And then all projects come into uh, R&D and they meander through all these different silos. And if you're lucky, uh, one of these days, they come out of the, the last ones. Well, this is really how the work should be done. Uh, it has to be done uh, concurrently across all these organization and uh, managed in, uh, in projects. This is actually something that uh, a lot of people learn from Toyota, the chief engineer concept. And um, a lot of people have tried to adapt these, uh, this chief engineer concept, but it doesn't work all by itself. Uh, really what we learned is you really have to have an appropriate organization or, it or it you will have a hard time applying this chief engineer uh, concept. At Goodyear, matrix organization works relatively well. Other companies had experience with other forms that, uh, that could also be adapted to, uh, to lean. One thing that I wanna stress out is the project management office. Um, you really have to learn project management. You really have to get good at project management. Just say, hey, we're gonna create chief engineers isn't quite good enough. 
And um, I, I also would like to uh, to stress here that uh, uh, that uh, the uh, this is also the basis of agile and everything else that uh, that's coming along uh, the road here. Uh, you really have to think about the or getting the appropriate or the right organization that works uh, for you as a as a company. So as I say, organization not ne uh, uh, necessary, but it is unfortunately not sufficient. You really have to, if you don't want to use a matrix organization, you have to move to people where the work is. And um, it re requires a certain flexibility. Uh, project managers, chief engineers, yes, very popular in the industry today. Also a project management office, a real project management function that takes care of the learning and uh, that uh, manage the, the project management knowledge. And then I also wanna say that um, uh, we know from Toyota, these uh, chief engineers are Superman. Well, I've seen many other companies, including Goodyear, where I wouldn't call them Superman, but I call them very competent project managers. And in every case, they represent the customer, they manage by influence, not authority, and uh, they drive collaboration and alignment. I will have a few more words on the collaboration and alignment here. So the other thing I want to stress is uh, that uh, you really have to implement lean on the highest possible level. On this curve, I show the outcome of a lean effort and how many different parts of the organization are engaged. If you only do it uh, on uh, in one little area, well, it may be even counterproductive. But the more different parts of the organization you um, you can engage, uh, uh, the results go up uh, exponentially with that. And uh, also, chances for visible result are better if lean is applied on the highest uh, level of the process. Okay, I wrote a few um, blogs on this subject They're called the one with the most tools wins. I see a lot of people sell tools, many, many, many tools. But you really, a lot of people don't know what to do with these tools uh, unless they understand the principles. So I want to encourage everybody, mindset, skill sets, then tool sets. And uh, a lot of people try to implement Agile as a tool well, you have to uh, implement agile as, as agile principles, and it requires the right organization, the right training, the right mindset, and the chances for agile to work are much higher if you have those pieces in place than just throwing a new uh, tool out. Okay, one other big, uh, very important piece is um, the, the what I call the shadows here. Uh, if you apply lean in an organization, and this will be the typical cost structure. You can see manufacturing materials are the high cost items. And especially in manufacturing, lean has been very popular if you want to reduce the direct cost of the, of the organization or of the business. But you can see R&D very, very, very small percentage. So those people who apply uh, lean in R&D to save cost have not been very successful because it is a very small amount. However, R&D influences the profitability very, very significantly. At Toyota, they say that uh, 75, that 95 percent of the profit on a car is decided when the engineers uh, develop that car, and that is kind of correct. Even though 95 percent it seems kind of high to me, but we really have to think about um, how can we apply lean to what R&D does for the business. And that's where you can generate very, very high uh, return. A good example is here, the red line would be your current product. And um, uh, we all know that after a certain time, a product lose their uh, possess, the um, uh, competition is coming along uh, with good products. And what do you do? You drop the price. And at, at that time, when you need your new product, and when that's the green curve, normally your innovation, you sell for more money, but after a few years, your innovation is dropping down. So what I uh, want to focus on here is the difference between having a new product or having to sell the old one. 
that is an enormous amount of money. And most companies don't even know high, how high that amount of money is. You can lose millions of dollars if you introduce your new product too late. So at Goodyear, we try to use lean to make sure we always have the right product at the right time, regardless of uh, what happens in the market. So that's where Agile comes in. And th that agility to have your new product at the right time, regardless of the market, what the market does. An example is the Goodyear Fuel Max um, uh, about 10 years ago, when all of a sudden the, the gas prices uh, skyrocketed, um, Goodyear took about less than six months to have a fuel economy tie out on the market. Well, it was the only one because uh, nobody else was able to, um, uh, to react that quickly. Uh, the company made a fortune on this product. If you're the only one, you can dictate the price. And um, by the time the fuel prices had dropped down, Goodyear had made a lot of money and our competitors were finally uh, able to come out with the competing uh, with the competing product. So what a lot of people don't understand is what I call the, uh, the cost of delay. The cost to the business over time, uh, the red line would be um, uh, not having a product. The green line here is missing a feature. Yes, you uh, lose a lot of, uh, not a lot, you lose a little bit of, uh, marketing revenue by missing a feature, but to delay a product uh, for uh, to have more features is normally not a good idea. But the really learning is here the, um, the additional resources. Normally, if you're in a situation like this where uh, the market demands the product, the loss to the business is normally much, much, much higher than uh, any additional resources that it takes to do that. And that's something that, uh, that we learned very clearly. And I really want to stress this. Um, uh, the revenue lost, uh, lost to the company is much, much, much higher than the resources it takes to get that product out when the, when the market needs it. So I'm going to skip uh, this one here very quickly. But I want to talk about the new product launch. Um, uh, you, most of you probably know this picture engineering throws it over the wall and then uh, now it's manufacturing's problem and then manufacturing uh, can't produce it and they send it back and then um, uh, you redesign it and then you uh, try it again well that is uh, costing a lot of money and uh, a lot of time if you work uh, this way so for me you in, if you want to win an innovation it has to be in the red area here where uh, the uh, where um, R and D, marketing, and manufacturing overlap. You can have a great idea for a product, but if nobody can sell it, you don't have a product. Or you can have a great idea and it sells well, and manufacture. There's no way that you can manufacturing at uh, manufacture it at a reasonable cost. You still don't have a product. So if you have to be in that. The zone. The best way to hit it is, um, by the way, this would be a traditional um, a value stream where everything is handed off uh, from one department uh, to the next one. You have an idea, you do commercial feasibility, technical feasibility, you develop the product, you start industrializing it, producing it, distributing it, marketing it, and collect the money. Why not work like uh, this? Work all at the same time work together. Once you have a new idea, run it by, um, uh, see what the marketing thinks about it, see what manufacturing thinks about it. And if there has to be uh, work done in manufacturing, in marketing, even in distribution, in sales, well, take a look at that from the very beginning and bring all those pieces along together. And, um, you will save an enormous amount of money uh, of time and once the product is ready you can hit the ground running and start selling this is a hospital here in akron ohio uh, they don't have it designed yet they, they just build a few cardboard models but in this room is everybody there's the president there's the um, uh, the chief operating officer there are the nurses there are the doctors there are even the crafts, the, the pipe fitters, the electricians, everybody is there together 
uh, at any stage to say, hey, wait a moment, do we all need all this many procedure rooms? Do we all need this many operating rooms? And uh, in fact, after this exercise, they threw uh, the original drawings away and the hospital that they built wasn't even close to the one that the architects had designed um, uh, at the beginning. Uh, I will skip the knowledge management here and I want to ask a uh, question. Can innovation have a process? When we tried to do lean, they all threw their hands up and said, oh, wait a moment, we are creative people here. Okay? Uh, and creativity can't have a process. Well, we learned uh, it can. So I have three phases of a product development process here. You get the innovation creation, you get the technology creation, and you get the product creation. Something very important that we learned uh, is a, uh, in a pivot point here. It's uh, what I call success assured. Uh, it happens at gate two in uh, the product development uh, piece. It is the moment when everybody sits down in a room and says, yes, this product will be successful. We will launch it. We know the launch date, which is determined by the market. We don't know all the features and the performance yet, but we will spend the money. Let's uh, spend the money on the tooling and everything and get that product out. So from here on, from success assured on out, I call it execution. The front part, I call it creation. That's where you have your new ideas, where you run your new ideas, and where you develop the technology for all these new ideas. So in the execution part, failure is no option. We know we're gonna have a product, it's a single piece flow, we're gonna launch it, and we know when we're gonna launch it. But on the creation part, totally different mindset. Here we wanna fail fast, we wanna fail often, we wanna try as many things as we can, and uh, have a process that really um, promotes that kind of thinking. Now, for me, it's a different process for these two uh, phases. It's a different lean uh, application in the execution phase than it's in the creation phase. And I want to start with the execution phase. Um, that's the phase that generates the income. Here's where the money is made that we can even afford to do all the innovation. Uh, and this part of the process is inspired by manufacturing. In fact, you can use most manufacturing tools and apply them straight to that part of the process. But by the way, don't try them in the creation piece. Uh, I already mentioned Goody got uh, an, um, a manufacturing award for this. And uh, the key is 100% of everything in that phase is delivered on time. And uh, the key is fast is better than slow. So we really want to focus on speed. Thing. And if I only had one uh, thing to spend my money or my energy on, I would spend it on speed because that's where you get your most, your biggest return. It gives you a competitive advantage, uh, faster learning, better risk management, better cash flow. But what we didn't know when we started, um, it also makes you efficient because you get efficiency because you stop doing all that stuff that that's no value and uh, you get a much uh, better return. So you actually get the efficiency for free. And there are many, many lean tools that apply here. Waste elimination, rapid learning cycles, flow, pull, visual management, and the managing to capacity is a couple that I wanna uh, uh, talk about here today. What's the biggest waste in R&D? And uh, we could have done a poll on it, but you would probably have gotten the poll right because uh, most of us know uh, it's the waiting. Defects can also cause a lot of uh, problem if you um, make design mistakes that uh, cause a lot of problems later. Uh, but I also want to stress the underutilization of your people. And I have a few more words on, uh, on that later. Um, the Tetris principle, you probably heard or know the, the Tetris game. And um, uh, when I plot uh, capacity versus uh, time in an R&D organization, it looks like a, a Tetris game. You got all these large projects. Uh, if you can de uh, decide uh, the, the, the programs like car companies uh, can do, uh, a lot of the capacity is used uh, with your model changes and so on. 
Then you do, uh, you stack your big projects or your medium projects on top of it and fill with uh, small projects. It works very well uh, for companies who can uh, decide uh, totally the time frame the, uh, when they launch new products. At Goodyear, that doesn't work so well because uh, we launch when our customers want to launch. And we always had a hard time fitting big projects in. But then we learned if we cut the projects down in very small pieces, it works very well. And then we even learned when you cut all your projects and manage all your projects in small pieces, the scheduling is no problem anymore. And uh, here's how it works in reality. You got your iterations. We do learning cycles, iterations, and uh, you do uh, in this case, five of them. And then we uh, launch all these different um, uh, we spin off all these different uh, derivatives of it. Now, breaking that further down, uh, like an iteration would be uh, making drawings, uh, uh, modeling, making computer modeling, design a mold, uh, make a mold, uh, produce prototypes, and then test them. So we learn that it doesn't, uh, we do not schedule these whole projects, these big projects anymore. We just schedule one piece of these projects. In this case, the prototypes. And then <clears throat> everything downstream is first in, first out, and everything upstream is managed with the pull process. In this visual planning room, uh, we schedule the prototype building of all 1,500 new products, all iterations with sticky notes. And that's really all it needs. And every week, uh, the business meets here for about uh, half hour. And all problems are visible in this visual planning room. Like, for example, here you can see uh, uh, yes and no, what was delivered on time, uh, what was not. Uh, there are dashboards for stuff that's not uh, visible directly. And all scheduling conflicts are managed by turning these uh, sticky notes uh, sideways. So if you're uh, the leadership, they know exactly what to look for. They can see scheduling conflicts, they can see late deliveries, they can see all other problems right in this room. And uh, we like to use a 10 second rule. Within 10 seconds, you need to know where your problems are and uh, uh, able to, uh, to address them. So um, the key is seeing all these deviations quickly having a standard problem solving process, uh, verifying the solution and uh, making the new process, uh, the new standard. The biggest problem here was the schedule to capacity because we were always over scheduling. Like if you have a typical development process here, this, what goes through the pipeline here is the capacity you have and you have all these hundreds of other projects that you never have, seem to have time for. So a lot of people use the hydraulic principle, just uh, push harder and think you get more done. But in reality, you get a lot less done when you do that. So uh, what we learned to do, actually, I'm um, using my cat here as an example. This is Max, and if uh, Max knows two tricks. And if I teach Max the third trick, I find out he forgets the first one. So it's the same with the, uh, with the project, uh, with um, uh, the R&D capacity. If you only have so much capacity, if you push more projects in, chances are that you get fewer of them done. So we use a pull process at Goodyear. Uh, we finish one, then we let a new one in. And everything else stays in a virtual queue until it's time to let the new project in. Uh, you can see these uh, thick lines here. They actually limit the capacity right in the planning stage. We only plan as much projects as we have capacity for. So right in the planning stage, in that one step that we plan, the, product, uh, the prototype development, we only schedule as many projects as we have capacity for. And from there on, we don't have to worry. Uh, nothing has to wait. Everything uh, flows through. So instead of push process, where you schedule every single step, we schedule one step of the process in this case, prototype manufacturing and use a pull and a Kanban to signal when it's time to start a new project. There's a picture of the Kanban card. And um, in fact, uh, then the Kanban cards go to the engineers who do the work 
and we use a similar visual planning process uh, that shows all the problems, like for example, scheduling problems, uh, or uh, if somebody needs help, it is visually identified. Even we show on there uh, when people need new work, and all the people who do the work meet in front of uh, such a board once a week and have very clear visibility for any problem that, uh, that they may have. I will skip the late start here in uh, order of uh, time because I want to spend a little time on the creative uh, part of this process. And the model that I want to use for the creative piece is uh, the fashion industry. Uh, a company like Zara, at the beginning of the fashion season, they uh, design hundreds of thousands of new garments. And uh, it's easy for uh, with uh, software to design those today. And then they give the drawings to some um, uh, shops around uh, their company in Spain, uh, like private houses mostly. And uh, they produce one or two each of these garments. And now they put these thousands of new garments into the stores at the beginning of the fashion season. And within several days, Sarah knows what sells and what doesn't sell. And then it takes them about two weeks to scale up. So whatever sells, within two weeks, they have mass production in the same stores. Now, that is a model that I like to use for product development. How can we, within uh, no time, figure out what sells and then scale it up to mass production as fast as we can from there? Okay, it's uh, not as easy as, uh, as, um, uh, as it sounds, but it can be done. The typical um, idea generation process uh, uh, is described like this. You get all these ideas going into a funnel, and then at the end, you figure out which ones you uh, produce, and then you make money on it. Well, that funnel hasn't worked very well, but what I show you here has worked. You start with the customer. Figure out what the customer wants, and when you have pin, uh, when you have really figured out one or two uh, pain points or solutions, that's when you start your brainstorming, and then you uh, pan out and diverge uh, as good as possible and uh, create as many uh, ideas on that one concept as you can, but. Then uh, you can see Zara here, they can uh, throw these ideas in the stores. Normally when you do it in an R&D organization, you are now stuck with thousands of projects. Well, that can't happen because you also need a process to converge on the, the winner. So try to diverge and get as many new ideas as possible, but then also efficiently uh, converge. And this is why I'd like to use lean and especially the lean startup thinking. And I want to use this little cycle with build, test, and learn, and run through that little cycle as fast as I can go from the, to go from diverge to, uh, to converge. And that's the idea of fail fast and uh, fail often. Now, if I had to uh, design the Tour de France, uh, you know, the, when, if you're familiar with the Tour de France, it's a race that goes over more than 20 days. And a lot of stages, uh, they uh, ride for 200 kilometers and then they do a photo finish. If I had to design the, the, this race, uh, I would uh, just ride five miles and do a photo finish and probably get the same results. And in fact, I could, uh, if we only ride five miles, we could run uh, five or 10 stages in one day and cut the cycle plan. Well, if you know the Tour de France, you would tell me that's impossible. And I agree. But that thinking is possible with product development. And this is where Scrum comes in and sprints. Actually, uh, that's why I showed you the sprint example of the Tour de France. Uh, working in very small steps, very limited time, maybe only allow one month uh, to explore an idea. Uh, Cross-functional and uh, very flexible with all the people involved. And after every cycle, make a decision. Is this the right idea? If not, stop it and do something else. This is quite well known, but there are two aspects uh, of Scrum that I want to uh, give you a little bit more information on. Uh, the one is in the right order and the other one is uh, with the minimum effort. So uh, all these questions are out on the table and uh, 
every time you start a new idea, any of those questions may be the most critical one. So start with the most critical, the highest risk and the highest impact question and walk your way down until uh, you uh, get below the, the, the risk threshold. And uh, only when you get there, start a project. The, the most critical question may be, is anybody gonna buy this thing? Is the technology even available or whatever the question is? But get that question answered first and don't move uh, on developing technology unless you absolutely know somebody will buy it or whatever else, uh, whatever order of questions you have uh, uh, decided. And the second idea is um, uh, the minimum um, uh, the viable product. What is the minimum that I need to do to answer a question? And um, uh, Zappos, um, they sell shoes online and it turned out the owner of Zappos couldn't get any money from the bank. So he threw his business plan away, took pictures of shoes in a shoe store, posted them online and watched what happened. And what happened is people actually gave him orders. And when he got an order, he bought the shoes, sent them out. And when people didn't like them, they returned them to him. And then he went back to the shoe store, exchanged them, sent them the new pair. Really, it took him no money, no effort at all to establish feasibility for, uh, for his new business. And in fact, a few months later, he didn't need any money anymore. Okay, the last part, I wanna spend a little time on uh, managing the people. And uh, I learned this from Toyota. If you, um, take the Ford uh, manufacturing plant a hundred years ago. And if you take a man, modern Toyota plant uh, today, there is, there's only 7% of automation in that, um, in that uh, Toyota plant. But the Ford model hundred years ago was, we hire a pair of hands. Toyota says today, we hire hands and brain. We wanna engage the people who built the cars and we want to find out from the people who built the cars, how can we build better cars? And that's the big difference, engaging the people. And um, uh, a typical, uh, for me, and a product, a new um, uh, lean uh, initiative uh, should have two pillars, a continuous improvement and the respect for people. Uh, most companies push the continuous improvement, but forget about the people. And uh, that is something that I want to stress. Uh, you have to bring the people along and engage them and empower them. And here are the four key pieces that I want to uh, hit on very, very quickly here. The first one is the best people, um, the uh, physician to make recommendations, to make improvements are the people who do the work. And they are the ones uh, who uh, in our case uh, have the ideas, develop the product, and they also should be empowered to be the technical expert. They should recommend the decision and not the leadership. Second piece is what I call uh, respect for people. Uh, I think that people come to work every day to do a good job. I still have to see people who come in and say, today I wanna really screw up. So if they screw up, it's not, it's most of the time not the people's fault. It's because they don't have the right product, uh, process, they don't have the right training, they don't have the right support, and all these other good things. So if something goes wrong, the first question that management should ask, was the process followed? And do these people have the right process and have the right uh, tools? So for me, that's what respect for people means. Hard on the process, easy on the people. And I, um, uh, this is Billy Taylor, by the way. Billy is the director of manufacturing uh, for North America. And Billy works for uh, Alice. Alice is the plant manager of uh, the Goody Akron plant. And Alice works for these people, that is uh, Dwayne and Bill. Because Alice wants to make sure Bill and uh, Dwayne are uh, successful. Because if Bill and Dwayne are successful, the company will make money and we will have um, a good, uh, we will have good uh, results. So uh, leadership's job is to help the people be successful. 
and uh, you all know this uh, uh, model on leadership, of course, but I want to turn that upside down. And I want to uh, stress that the role of the leaders is to help the people be successful. And uh, pretty much uh, they have the right to know, of course, uh, what's going on, but not the right to tell people what to do. The leaders should go out um, to talk to people, to see what's going on. It should be their job to engage the associates, um, but also hold them accountable and uh, speak the, the native language and learn to lead uh, without authority. So for me, uh, so these are the components of a successful um, uh, lean product development process. Uh, with the right mindset, uh, lean thinking can uh, do uh, at least as much, if not even more, uh, for innovation than it does uh, for services or manufacturing. It takes some prerequisites like the right organization, the focus on uh, the value that an R&D organization can create. There are two different processes. You use different thinking in a creative process than in the, in the execution part. But the most important part is that you bring along the people, that you uh, engage them uh, in the process improvements and keep them engaged and empower them to make the right decisions. And uh, as Mario Andretti always said, if everything seems under control, you're just not going fast enough. I want to leave uh, my uh, contact information here and uh, answer any questions that may have come up. So, great uh, presentation, Robert. I uh, I picked up on a lot of it. Uh, I pretty much, obviously, coming from a software development background here at our company, a lot of the concepts that you're discussing you have come from Agile that I feel often um, companies, when we're preaching about it, feel that it's not applicable to their business because they're in the manufacturing space. So I, 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 I like how you've taken each and you've taken it into Goodyear and, and showed them that it is possible. Um, you focus much less on the you know time and cost lean reduction of the manufacturing portion and much more focused on the product development and innovation side of it uh, and using the people for improvement, something that I tell everyone, they say, well, of course we would allow improvement, but I said, is there a tool or a platform for them to raise and collaborate and op are you that open to improvement and hear what they have to say versus pushing changes down into the company? So hey, uh, you got that pretty uh, summarized pretty well, Scott. Um, also, I, I like the whole concept around uh, speed. I think. Uh, even the whole concept of over-processing, I find leads to defects. If you had done half of it up first and then tested it, you may have realized you didn't need the additional features because uh, once once the, you got feedback from the actual public, uh, it wasn't necessary. So instead of you save your time on the processes, processing end, but on top of that is that the additional month you spent on adding the additional functions often is the portion that has the additional problems and defects yeah. associated with it. So it's a win-win yeah. strategy. All right, so a couple of questions, I guess. Uh, uh, first, being on, from that, from my end, what do you, because I get this question all the time, what do you tell people when they say, oh, okay, because everyone's saying uh, what you're talking about doesn't, you know, you're talking about Amazon, you're talking about Google, but uh, we're a small manufacturing company. How can, what would be the key criteria to adopt such a strategy? I mean, I know you, you touched on a lot of it, but what would be a great response to that? Well, um, I have to tell you, would tell you that the, the principles that work for Google or Amazon or anybody like that will also work for you as a small manufacturing company. I can absolutely guarantee you that principles work the same. Uh, you may uh, put more focus on one versus the other, things like that. Of course, um, that is uh, uh, a different story, but uh, once you learn the principles, understand the principles, you will very quickly find out how to apply them and uh, how they work. The second piece is uh, to engage the people. Uh, any Amazon, any Google will have to do that the same way than any small manufacturing company. So, 
uh, those uh, that is an absolute given um, that uh, uh, a sustainable um, uh, implementation really requires the uh, engagement of the people and the empowerment of the people. So uh, those are the two main things that I would uh, uh, leave you with. And if you do those two things, understand those, uh, get started, but then uh, understand the process, focus on your process, find out where, uh, what is the most important thing for you and uh, focus on that and go down the chain of, um, uh, of uh, uh, getting the most impactful uh, things done, and I'm uh, I'm pretty sure you will see results. Thanks. I, I also uh, I saw on some of your slides you had a uh, you know the the whole wall of post-its. So yes. uh, this is this is an approach we had adopted as well, but this is again coming from a personal challenge. How did you find it sustainable as you grew? So when we're smaller. But as we got, you know, to 50, 100, et cetera, plus employees to for it to be sustainable for everyone to move their sticky papers uh, along the wall, uh, we got a lot of kickback. And the more we grew into multiple locations, they also said the sticky papers were no longer valuable because, you know, that's in one office. So now you're in many yeah. offices. Obviously, we moved to, to products to support us like Jira, and, but we moved away from the sticky paper but i see a large company like goodyear is still leveraging that and how did you make it sustainable to still work with the sticky paper um, I, I didn't say still leveraging uh, that's what we use everybody is comfortable with it and by the way there is a high resolution um, uh, web camera uh, mounted uh, that you didn't see ah. um, people uh, off-site uh, use that camera uh, they can dial in at any time and the camera has enough resolution to read the notes and that's how they participate in meetings and by the way I've, uh, you can also buy a robot that walks around in that meeting mm -hmm. and uh, where you can uh, uh, at least see the faces of the people, uh, the offsite people that are that are engaged. Uh, that can be done, but um, uh, the, this, the, the, there's one thing that uh, cannot be replaced by a computer. That is, have everybody in that room looking at the same problem at the same time. Um, that is something that is absolutely critical. If you want to computerize it, you find the computer tools, I have no problem with it. But everybody has to be there looking at each other's face and uh, making a decision. It, uh, it, it, these problems are not solved by email. These problems are solved face to face right then and there. And it's the equivalent of, an, uh, of a stand up meeting in a manufacturing organization, the stand up meeting that they have in the morning where they really lay out, hey, what are we going to um, focus on today? What are our problems? What did we get done uh, today? Uh, if that happens, it doesn't matter to me uh, what format you use. Uh, I have here a two-part question. So first of all, what are some of the initial actions taken to begin the transformation to lean product development? And what are on the flip side, what are the some of the primary speed bumps that expect to encounter? Yeah. Um, the initial action was to um, uh, to learn and educate. Uh, it's hard to engage people if you don't educate them first. So uh, uh, we uh, uh, educated everybody on lean, on lean thinking, and then we formed a uh, team uh, with the right people to analyze uh, what we were doing and uh, understand where were our biggest problems in product development and then to uh, figure out how lean thinking can apply to solve those. In the case of Goodyear R&D, it was delivery. We just weren't able to deliver when marketing uh, needed something. So that was uh, the original focus. The big speed bumps uh, for me are engaging the leadership. I sometimes feel it's easier to engage the associates even than to engage the leadership. And there again, uh, you start engaging leadership with education more than anything else. And uh, the leadership has to also change. It's not enough if leadership says, hey, people have to change. No, leadership is part of the people. Their job is to support the people. In order to do that, they have to change with the process. So for me, that was one of the major challenges. Uh, how did you get them on board in your case uh, the leadership uh, team? education 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 
and then uh, we got uh, our leaders engaged in um, uh, teaching uh, the associates and of course that took some effort but uh, if they are out there uh, teaching lean uh, principles to associates uh, you can't believe how quickly they change their own behaviors uh, i see here also a question actually asking how applicable is your framework for software development in a state government agency so I'll, I think it's definitely applicable coming from the software world. <laughs> I think I, uh, I must have given you that answer. It depends on the principles. There will be different principles you apply in different uh, organizations, in different processes. It all depends on your business, on your culture, on, uh, on many, many different things. But the principles are the same. And um, the, the, it all starts with uh, education and engaging the people who do the work, because those are the people who understand the process, they understand the problems, they are the ones uh, to sustain it. So uh, you educate them and then you get them engaged and let them um, uh, drive the, 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 the improvement from there. To me, that's, um, I, I learned that um, the hard way, uh, but, um, Really looking back, uh, that's made the biggest difference. And if I help somebody else today, that's what I focus on first. With them. Yeah, and definitely. I think it's uh, obviously everything you touched on is now part of continuous agile. And even the whole aspect of uh, cross-functional teams where uh, you use the example from Zara, it's the same concept where by each feature you're developing, no longer is it product rights a requirement then development uh, test, uh, creates it, and then QA tests it. Now we everyone's using micro teams. So each team does one feature, right, and sits around the table and within a sprint delivers those functions as a team. So and, you, uh, you thanks to the, the yeah. uh, to the software people for developing that and teaching the rest of the world. It works very, very, very well in many other areas. Um, let's see, one more, I guess, similar to the previous question of, I guess, how to get started, but more, what could be one small thing that people can start doing tomorrow regarding lean product development, if you had to make a choice? <laughs> uh, I would start uh, pulling a few people together and, um, uh, and see uh, how we can educate them. It can be done relatively well uh, or relatively quickly. Um, uh, I would definitely uh, start with uh, education. The other thing that you can do tomorrow is um, to get a group of people together and see, hey, where, um, uh, well, okay, this is the difficult part. People uh, uh, jump on that randomly. And I went through that many times. I uh, did that experience. People jump on uh, the problem of the day or, or whatever. And I would uh, uh, say, look at uh, your, your corporate strategy and look at what you are trying to accomplish as a company. And then ask yourself the question, what could we improve to help the company achieve that objective? And that's not going to be an easy thing to do. And you may have to have a very cross-functional team there. Uh, and uh, if, if you get the manufacturing, the marketing, the, the salespeople and everybody involved, uh, you will look at everything totally differently because uh, I can guarantee you they have a different view on things, they have a different opinion. And if you put all these opinions together, I think that's where you can uh, find uh, what can make the biggest impact uh, to the company. Uh, it may not be done in a day, but uh, start that way. And uh, what you come up after a few days is gonna be meaningful. Um, just jumping at the random first thing, uh, very, very uh, rarely is sustainable and um, uh, and then uh, when it's non-sustainable, people say, oh, this whole lean stuff doesn't work. Let's do something else. And uh, that's what I see in many, many places. Yeah, sticking to it. Yeah, and of course, sticking to it. Once it works, sticking to it. Yeah, I definitely see that because uh, they'll, they often treat these things as projects versus programs. And then what ends up happening, a project has a start and an end. So you can't 
roll all the people that are dedicated to this, right? All right. And so, by, the way, by the way, a scrum cycle has a start and an end, and that's uh, the beauty of it. Yeah, exactly. But overall, then you it's it's an ongoing program, right? Every every to right. sprint, to sprint, to sprint. And you do another one, and another one, and another one, and that's the way to work. Exactly. All right. Uh, we've hit the uh, one hour mark, so I want to thank again uh, Norbert for taking your time today. It was really informative. I really appreciate it. And uh, if anyone has any follow up questions, feel free to send them over. I'd be happy to share them with him directly, as well as there's a short uh, survey at the end if uh, any feedback or recommendations is always appreciated. So uh, thanks again, Norbert, for taking the time. Well, you're very welcome. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Bye.